want to begin by plugging a book. Those of you who've read Sam's previous books, uh, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, um, will know how beautifully he writes. And I just want to begin by um, illustrating it from the new book. I just want to read a couple of paragraphs. Oh, sure. The current head of the NIH, that's Francis Collins, recommends that we, that, that's the Na National Institutes of Health in America, recommends that we believe the following propositions. One, Jesus Christ, a carpenter by trade, was born of a virgin, ritually murdered as a scapegoat for the collective sins of his species, and then resurrected from death after an interval of three days. Two, he promptly ascended bodily to heaven, where for two millennia he has eavesdropped upon, and on occasion even answered, the simultaneous prayers of billions of beleaguered human beings. Three, not content to maintain this numinous arrangement indefinitely, this invisible carpenter will one day return to earth to judge humanity for its sexual indiscretions and skeptical doubts, at which time he will grant immortality to anyone who has had the good fortune to be convinced on mother's knee that this baffling litany of miracles is the most important series of truths ever revealed about the cosmos. Four, every other member of our species, past and present, from Cleopatra to Einstein, no matter what his or her terrestrial accomplishments, will be consigned to a far less desirable fate, best left unspecified. Five, in the meantime, God, Jesus, may or may not intervene in our world as he pleases, curing the occasional end-stage cancer or not, answering an especially earnest prayer for guidance or not, consoling the bereaved or not, through his perfectly wise and loving agency. Just how many scientific laws would be violated by this scheme? One is tempted to say all of them. And yet, judging from the way that journals like Nature have treated Collins, one can only conclude that there is nothing in the scientific worldview or in the intellectual rigor and self-criticism that gave rise to it that casts these convictions in an unfavorable light. Well, there's a lot like that in the book, which I hope is enough to recommend it. But <laughs> Sam, you began by talking about utility of belief, and um, people who say that religion is useful, has a, mm. has a utility, because it somehow gives us a moral, a moral compass. And you, you, you quoted religious people who say that, and of course they do. But I think what disturbs me more, and I wonder whether you agree, is those non-religious people who say something like, of course, you and I don't need religion, we don't right. need religion, right. but the riffraff out there do. I mean, um, that is at best condescending. Yeah, it, it's, it's profoundly condescending and, and also quite cynical and unimaginative. It, it, it's as though those purposes can't be served any other way and will never be served any other way. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it closes the horizons of human collaboration and creativity in a way that it just seems truly bizarre. Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's not a well thought out position on the part of our fellow secularists. I, I sense that you, in a way you make life easy for yourself by uh, concentrating on the truly appalling things like the Taliban uh, and, uh, well I remember a few years ago, I think in this very room, listening to the psychologist Nicholas Humphrey giving a beautiful lecture called What Shall We Tell the Children? And he spoke about uh, a girl who archaeological evidence shows was sacrificed, I think, to the sun god in Peru, uh, I think a, a few centuries ago. And he quoted anthropologists who speculated that this girl was no doubt looking forward to being sacrificed. The great honor it was to her to be, to be sacrificed. And, and Humphrey was quoting the same kind of moral relativists as you, you've been quoting. And he then got spectacularly and movingly angry. How dare these anthropologists say such, such things? How dare we, listening to documentaries on our televisions about things, get a sort of warm, glowy feeling about this girl fulfilling her ambitions 
because of her religious uh, be belief. Do, do you happen to know that? The history of human sacrifice is truly amazing to con contemplate. There is a book uh, entitled Human Sacrifice by uh, last name Davies. Uh, I actually cite it in, in my afterword to Letter to a Christian Nation, which is on my website. Uh, but it's, it's astonishing that, that almost any culture you could name had a tradition of human sacrifice. And I actually don't doubt that people went willingly and eagerly to, to their deaths because if you have the requisite beliefs, it makes sense. It was, it was believed that you could, you could engage this one-way dialogue with the ancestors by just going to meet them. Uh, uh, you could cure the king of his venereal disease and, and uh, save all the people you love from, from the wrath of God by, by uh, uh, being sacrificed. Now, of course, other people were, were sacrificed involuntarily as well, but uh, one of the, the embarrassing things about Christianity is it actually it, it stands astride this truly contemptible history not as a, any kind of departure from it. Christianity is not a religion that rejects human sacrifice. It's a religion that celebrates a single human sacrifice as though it were fully effective. Uh, and people tend to elide this, this kind of bizarre uh, commitment um, but uh, to the point of, of making things easy for myself, you're, you're not the first, inevitably, uh, incidentally, to point that out, that I've made things easy for myself. But it's, it's actually, unless you have an argument against the, the, these clear cases, it seems to me you don't have an argument at all for moral relativism. Yes, that's right. I mean, you, yeah. You've got a baseline for your, for your landscape, yeah. but that, so that the peaks can kind of stand out from this baseline that presumably everybody will agree to, yeah, yeah. but you do come up against, and you mention them, of course, both in your talk and, and in your book, the sort of standard problems with utilitarianism. I mean, I, I take it you would describe your philosophy as a, a kind of scientific utilitarianism. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of, uh, or more broadly speaking, consequentialism, but the reason why I don't eagerly answer to that name is that Everyone thinks they know that there's, a, there's just a, an obvious stalemate between consequentialism and its rivals, and that that makes sense. And uh, I think it's, it's many of the concepts and many of the distinctions in moral philosophy have prevented us from, from actually thinking about moral truth in the, con in the context of science. So I'm presenting a new argument, and there are many, many aspects of my argument that, that, are, that don't track consequentialism. Um, one of the problems with consequentialism is that people don't think very imaginatively about what counts as a consequence. So you have the, the, the classic trolley problem that many of you have probably heard of. This is, this is ubiquitous now in, in, in moral philosophy and in, in neuroscientific research on morality. You have a train coming down the track, and it's going to hit and kill five workmen who don't see it coming. But you stand at a switch, and you can throw, throw the switch, and the train will take another track, and there it will only kill one workman. And so you, people are asked, you know, should you flip that switch? Now, when asked this, 95% of people say, well, absolutely, you have to flip that switch. You, you save a net four lives. You'd be a moral monster not to, to uh, do that. But you can pose the problem another way. You now stand on a footbridge overlooking the, the trolley track. The trolley's coming down the track, and there's a suitably large person at your side who you can push into the path of the un oncoming trolley, killing him, obviously, but saving a net four lives. And now, posed under this guise, 95% of people say you'd be a monster to push that fat man onto the track. Uh, now, I, I happen to think this is somewhat ill-posed because I think we all have an intuitive physics and we burn a fair amount of fuel wondering whether the fat man is really going to stop the trolley. Uh, but even if you even if you finesse it and, and make it clear that... that uh, uh, he will, they seem different, these situations. Now, from, a, from the, the usual consequentialist point of view, people say, well, it's the same. You, you just have body count. This is actuarially, this is the same scenario. But maybe it is, in fact, not the same. If it is just fundamentally different to push a person up close and personal to his death than to flip a switch, if, if that difference can never be uh, reformed, then, they, then they're not, in fact, the same. If you're going to wake up with nightmares for the rest of your life because you push someone, 
but feel like a hero because you flipped a switch, those are the consequences that have to be uh, built into our analysis. And, and there, there are many ways in which, which traditional, the traditional discussion of these issues uh, breaks down. Uh, so uh, that's Another that. version of that one is the, is the um, uh, hospital where there's one patient who needs a kidney transplant, another patient needs a heart transplant, another patient needs a lung transplant, another patient needs a liver transplant, and there are no organs available. But then the doctors notice that there's somebody in the waiting room who has a perfectly healthy one of all these things. <laughs> so you can kill one to save, to save four. And it's, it's, it's the same point, that the, the positive act of killing somebody is one that nobody warms to. And just, but just imagine if we all lived in a society where at any moment you could be sitting in your doctor's office thinking you're getting a checkup and you could be <laughs> grabbed and vivisected for the sake of others. This is, we would be, we live in constant terror. Uh, so these are the kinds of consequences you have to think of. And, 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 uh, but again, I, my argument is if something matters, it has to matter, it has to be amenable to a, a, a discussion of the conscious experience of conscious creatures. And, and so I use well-being as a kind of catch-all for that mattering. If it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. If there, if there, if there are differences, if there are trade-offs uh, in which we all recognize this is a different world, but it's sort of just as good as world A is sort of just as good as world B, but different, well, then it doesn't matter. If there's one slice of pie here, uh, and if I get it or Richard gets it, one the other can't get it, there is a zero-sum uh, uh, opposition here, but how different is a world in which he gets it versus the one I get it? Well, it's, it's, it's different to one of us, but globally speaking, it's not so different. These are, these are, uh, these are issues in which different, we have to ask whether differences matter or not in some kind of global sense. Now. This doesn't necessarily give us guidance in every traditional moral conundrum, uh, but my argument is that the most important moral decisions are ones in which it's not zero-sum, uh, that the most important moral decisions are the ones where all boats will start to rise with the same tide. I mean, just ask yourself, how good could human life be? I mean, how, how could we build a global civilization in which the, the maximum number of people truly flourish Solving that problem is not going to entail working a billion people to death as slaves for all of our enjoyment. I mean, those are the kinds of examples uh, that, that are, are given. We're so deeply social. Our happiness is, is so obviously predicated on the creativity and flourishing of others. We're not atomized selves where our selfishness can be maintained in opposition to all others. Our, the only way to be wisely selfish in this world is to care about others. And when you look at the kinds of things sane people want, like love and friendship and community, I mean, these are, these are intrinsically social and, and non-zero-sum concerns. Another objection that you must meet all the time, I'm guessing, is the, the Brave New World um, right. objection. I mean, what if you could spray the whole world with a happiness drug, uh, which... Um, which uh, made us feel good all the time and never uneasy, never, never unhappy. But then we'd, we would never, according to the savage in Brave New World, we would never appreciate Hamlet, we'd never appreciate Romeo and Juliet. Um, uh, some people would say that we would lose an enormous amount while nevertheless suffering would increase by possibly your criteria. <laughs> 